Hello everybody and welcome to worship on this day or in this evening or the wee hours of the early morning, wherever you are watching, whatever time, whoever you are, you are so welcome to join in this experience in this moment. So my friends, today is Christ the King Day. It's also known as the reign of God, this reign falling soft and deep and clear, rain down upon us with your grace. This rain is calling us into an alternative to the systems of dominion, all the isms that condemn and mock and deride and destroy. This week, it was revealed that a small group of Australian special forces committed atrocities in our names. They believed themselves to be above and beyond. They were like kings. We gather together today to be part of the breaking down of those powers that be, that would break apart and smash and spit upon the bones of the fathers and the farmers and their children. We join together with the Defence Force Chief and we say, not in our name, and to the people of Afghanistan, we are sorry. Never again. My friends, let us enter into a space of connecting with a bigger story. A story that is shot through with glory. Let us worship our God. We gather together to worship on the land of the Wurundjeri people. As we gather with knowledge that the wattle, the cockatoo and the bend in the Spira Run River was taken without consent or negotiation. We give our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and we pledge ourselves to work alongside these first peoples to achieve a just future for all. The reading is from the New Revised Standard Version, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger, and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. 
Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Here ends the reading. For our children's space this morning, I'm going to share with you a poem, a street poem by a local artist. You may, if you pay attention, see some rainbow coloured steps there at the heart of the song. We're playing this today partly because it's a lovely local story, but also because in the reading, it's about the separation of the sheep and the goats. And this poem is all about how there should be no separation and that actually there should be a place for everyone, those that have been left at home, those who live their lives in different ways, those who love different people, all of us together. For the lovers and the ones alone, For the mothers and those with empty rooms. For the fathers and guardians, housemates, kids, carers and parents. The full house families, the partners in no garden apartments. The this house feels too big, now I'm in it alone. For the ones in it alone. For the ones whose bodies never quite fit their souls. And the ones whose economic status never matched their goals, who, no matter how high they held their heads, they still never felt seen, and no matter how many times they turned their face, they never had enough cheeks. For the ones with bruises, where no one sees, with partners who never agree, with lovers they can't tell anyone about without risking their lives, without changing tides, without losing love and family, and home, and home, and home and home for the ones stuck at home. With four walls and a battlefield of trauma to navigate alone. For the ones stuck at home. With a family they love and a grief they can't place and an argument they can't rationalise and tears they can't stop and a bank balance that's falling and a friend out of reach. For the friends out of reach. Watching their loved ones fall apart on handheld devices who wrap their fingers around the screen, hold their phones so tight in hope they might make it through, in hope that their friends survive. For the lovers, and the ones alone, you've got this. Through the darkest hours, through the longest days, you've got this. Through the grief and through the pain, you've got this. And though sometimes it may not even make sense, got this and the times when there seems there's no escape you settled for less and you made that okay no no the doors will open the bruises will fade you will surface the strength that you need to walk away you will touch another you will be held food will make it to your table friends will make it to your side your dreams well you make them that one's for you to decide But even the darkness is framed by light. And we know what is wrong because we understand what is right. And I see that you get it. I see it. I know. Because you made it this far. And that, that is an achievement in itself. So for the lovers and the ones alone, you have got this. Pope Pius VI instituted the Feast of Christ the King Day in 1925. I wonder why he did that. The world was reeling from the horrors of the First World War. The ghosts of those left behind in the trenches haunted 
the families without fathers, the sisters without brothers. The world was bereft. Many felt that there was no meaning, there was no purpose, and that if God, God, God in the sky did exist, then God was of no use. Secularism was on the rise, the barbarian was champing at the gate, and many folk of faith began to doubt either that Christ even existed or that if he did, he had no power and no authority to bring goodness to the earth. The poor Pope, poor Pope, decided to create a day, a day to stem the rising tide of despair. Look, look, he said, holding up his shining Jesus. Look, Christ is a king. We all long for hope in the dark. To be a king is a funny thing. The king in his counting house, the king on his horse, long live the king off with his head. The king, the king, the king is dead. The Jesus that we are given in the stories from the gospel come to us as four distinct yet interwoven archetypes. And none of them are king. In Mark, we have the ragged activist. He's all fire and fury, and he is symbolised by the lion. As theologian Frederick Beekner writes, Mark was a man in a hurry, a man out of breath, a man with no time to lose. The authorities were on his back, they were out for his blood, and he was on the run. Mark ends his book halfway through a sentence. Everything is held. There is no time to gather up the loose ends. Wonderful and terrible things are happening all around him, and more was still to come. Mark knew about fear. He knew about that prickling at the back of your neck, your scalp is cold, your mouth is dry, and there is a midnight rap at your door. But Mark also knew, he knew that fear was not the last thing. It was the next to last thing. The last thing was hope. In the Gospel of Luke, we have the doctor, sometimes known as the healer, and he comes to us as ox. Steady, thoughtful, hard-working Luke was almost certainly a Greek-speaking Gentile himself who put his Gospel together, based on Mark, to preach to the Gentiles. And, as Beekner again writes, Luke makes sure that nobody misses the point. The point is that Jesus was always stewing about the terrible needs of the poor. And Luke thought that if you think, you know, that you've got heaven made and you don't let it worry you, that the children on the other side of the tracks are half starving to death, then you know what? You're kidding yourself. In the Gospel of Matthew, we get the winged man the angel. We know that Matthew didn't write his gospel like Luke from scratch, but included virtually all of Mark in it and told stories. He was a storyteller. Matthew was also a tax collector and a historian. And according to Beekner, the main thing that Matthew wanted to say was that Although Jesus was born in the sticks and never had more than two cents to rub together and was ignored by just about everybody who mattered and in the end was strung up between two crooks, he was the same Messiah, the same Christ, the same anointed one of the Lord that Israel had been waiting for with tears in her eyes. Finally, finally, we have the Gospel of John, which is symbolised, as we know, by the eagle. The Jesus in John's Gospel, like the winged bird who rises above the earth, appears to see all, to know all, 
and from his great height, from his magnificence, comes to reveal the glory. Beekner, majestic, mystical, aloof. The Jesus of the fourth gospel walks about three feet off the ground. He was a poet and he knew about words. The gospel of John is as different from the other three as night from day. Matthew quotes scripture. Mark lists miracles. Luke reels off parables. But the one thing they all had in common was to say something about the 33 or so years that Jesus lived and worked and walked upon the earth. They were about action. John's not so interested in the action. <laughs> he is all about the words. According to John, what Jesus does is speak. He speaks. He speaks words. He is the word. The word that breaks the heart and sets the feet dancing and stirs up the tigers in the blood. So, four different entry points into the same man and none of them even close to king. And yet here we are on Christ the King Day. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a monkey by the, you're in, you're out. Do you want to come to my party? You. Yeah, do you want to come? You can't come. <laughs> I didn't invite you. Nobody invited you. Who is this Jesus? This one, the one that we heard about today, sorting out the sheep from the goats. Jesus as bouncer, perhaps standing at the gates of the coolest club in the universe. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's heaven. No, you're not coming in. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. Jesus as Santa, trying to work out if we've been naughty or nice. Have you been good this year? How good? Sheep? Goat? How much of this goodness can you take credit for? How much of getting through this dreadful year can you feel smug about? Well, at least I got through lockdown without having a breakdown. <laughs> Well, at least uh, we got through without tearing each other apart, eh? Not like my brother's family. Oh, my goodness. Well, at least I got through without drinking like a fish. Hmm? Not like, uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. At least I got through lockdown without watching too much Netflix, without sleeping all day. At least, at least, at least. We love us a judgment, don't we? A compare and contrast. At least we're better than them. Throughout our 2,000 year history, the Christian church has been very quick to pass judgments on each other and, oh, I don't know, on the goats. Who are the goats exactly? Oh, those wily goats. Too sly, too black, too gay, too poor, too Catholic, too Protestant, too Muslim, too destitute. And this is one of the texts that has often been used to justify this judgment. But in the words of theologian David Luce, in this parable, Jesus promises to always be with us and with those who are in greatest need. Which means that if we want to experience God's presence fully, deeply, truly, then we will look for God in the need of those around us and indeed in our own need as well. God comes to us where we least expect God to be, in the plight of the homeless, on the side of the poor, in the face of the needy, and in the company of the imprisoned. This vision of Christ as, as judge, Christ as king, it's never really cut it with me. And if Christ is judging, then it's not so much about the individual it's about the collective because everything is connected. And surely as the poet Lynn Unger wrote in her poem, Pandemic, that we shared on our church window at the beginning of lockdown, surely if we have learnt nothing else this year, we have learnt this, 
to know not that we are sheep or goats, but that we are all interconnected, that we are connected in ways that are more terrifying and more beautiful. We could hardly deny it now. And know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely this at least has become clear. The Pope Pius VI and all the writers of the Gospels, all the king's horses and all the king's men have been trying to put Jesus back together again in their own image to fulfil the hunger and need of their time. Who do we need as we wake up to this new pre-vaccine COVID-19 world, who do we need Jesus to be? And who do we need to be for each other and for our children as we peer out full of questions into this trembling and still locked down world? Hello. Uh, this song, I think it's called Have You Forgotten? Uh, several years ago, I organized a individual silent retreat, just myself, at the Centre for Spirituality and Ecology in Glenburn, Victoria. And uh, while I was there, I sneaked into their library, uh, snuck into their library and uh, looked through their their, their books, they have lots of beautiful books on, mainly on Christian uh, creation spirituality. And uh, one of the books was a songbook, and this song was in that songbook. I think it was written by a nun, but I can't remember. So if anyone has any clues about it, feel free to let me know. Uh, but it's really stayed with me, this, this song, so I hope you like it. Too late for you to remember.
Maybe just sit for a moment with that song, with that idea, with the energy of the Holy Spirit in your body. With the energy of the creek beside me. And maybe with the the energy of that of that prayer. Thank you. Greetings, good people. It's lovely to be with you in this space and to share a time of prayer together. What a great story from Matthew's Gospel and a reminder for me to not be distracted by theology and arguments and the latest ideas and oh and the news and Facebook and my phone but to keep it simple the important stuff is actually our actions it's how we live it's how we care and share and put love into our interactions with the world around us so as we pray I invite you just Take a moment to pause and be still and to breathe. Breathe deeply. To think about the earth on which we stand. And to pay attention to what's around us. Borrowing some words from Heather Price, God who in all things lives within, may your will be known by heart and seen in my deeds. May your will be known by heart and seen in our deeds. Let's pray. God, we're mindful of those who are hungry and the call to feed them. And we give thanks for all the ways that we can make a difference. Think about all the donations here at St Andrews, which go to the Church of All Nations Food Bank. And we think of Natalie Dixon feeding all the people in Kew. And we think of the ASRC and Food Share and Second Bite. And the list goes on and on and on. And we need to keep sharing because there are still hungry people. Just keep sharing. And we think of those who thirst and those who do not have access to safe drinking water still in 2020. I give thanks for all the agencies who are raising funds and digging wells and planting trees and educating communities and making such a life-giving difference. It's a simple thing, but it makes so much difference. Water. 
We're also encouraged to be mindful of strangers. This is a really strong biblical thread, isn't it? Urging us to be welcoming and to offer hospitality. And it's a tough one in terms of personal safety and fear that we carry, suspicion of the other, quite the tension. But that experience of being welcomed and of belonging are such powerful kingdom traits. Certainly a challenge. Welcome the stranger. And the reading also encourages us to clothe the naked. Now this is not a context that I literally encounter, but some do. And we can give thanks for all who help in the clothing industry and in our op shop, for example, for the op shop sorters and the menders and those who donate and those who assist and for the dignity that is offered to those who need clothing. And we're urged to think of the sick and we pray for all who care for them. I give thanks for our amazing healthcare system and for nurses and doctors and hospitals and pharmacists and administrators. And I give thanks that now in 2020 things are getting better and we can actually visit the sick. It's been tough, hasn't it? I think of the families. Think of neighbours and friends, those who notice and those who care. And we give thanks. And we're also encouraged to visit the prisoners and think of those who are locked up and those who are locked down and the creative ways that people have been visiting. We think of those who are on the margins of society, the outsiders people who are isolated, people who are stuck, people who are struggling. God, I ask that you help us to remember them, to include them and to keep journeying with folk even through their dark places, to be companions and to hold a light. So these are the things that ultimately matter and God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. May God's will be known in our hearts and seen in our deeds. Pay attention to what's happening around you in this world. And may grace and love be our guide this day and all days. Amen. In uh, today's reflection, I quoted some of a poem by Lynn Unger called Pandemic. And this, um, this poem has been turned into a choral piece, which we're going to share today as our blessing. <laughs>